All right, and we're doing this again. It's another Friday, so it's another episode of Remote Voices. We have uh, Jordan and Hunter here as usual, and we have an amazing guest in our wonderful friend, Laurel, who uh, I asked to introduce herself to me so that I would know what to say, and she named like 40 things that she did, so I'm gonna go ahead and let her start. Uh, she has to introduce herself, say what she does, and then also tell us about this time she did a Zoom call with a dead body. That's how we started this stream. We were all very confused. We yes. nothing about this, but that's how Here we, we got started. So, Laurel, it's all you. I brought out my big guns too early. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm the CEO of Distribute Consulting. We are a consulting management firm that specializes exclusively in remote work. And so we advise Fortune 500 companies as well as international governments on how to start and strengthen and leverage remote workforces. Um, I'm also the founder of the Remote Work Association, which is a community of remote work advocates and dead body story. Um, so I've been weird. a remote worker for 13 yes. years. Yeah, so I have seen, I don't want to say that I've seen it all, but I've never met anybody that has topped this story, which I'll give you the short version. It was just a standing appointment with a, an old client of mine, and I uh, noticed that his background was different than usual. Like in remote land, we all know that we're we become very familiar with our backgrounds. And I was like, hey, you're not in your usual spot. Where are you? And he's like, oh, I'm at my mother-in-law's house. And I said, oh, how's she doing? Now, he was quite a bit older, so I knew that his mother-in-law was not in the best oh, health. Man. And uh, yeah, you can see where this is going. <laughs> I already am seeing where this is going, yeah. I'm, I'm very... <laughs> Go on, go, continue. Yeah, and 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 that was it. It's exactly what you think. And I, he said, "Well, not so well. She passed away last night." And I said, oh my god! Oh, I said, "Oh, I'm so sorry. Like, you did not need to be yeah. on this call. Like, oh my word!" And then he's like, "Oh no, it's okay. We're just we're just here with her, and we're just waiting." And I said wait, what? And I'm just trying to process all of this information. And before I know it, he turns the webcam no! and, and there she is. And I was just like, ah! like, I mean, what people don't understand is like in remote land video calls, it's your office. Like it's a, it's a very yeah, yeah. real space for us. Right. So I, I honestly felt like somebody had just wheeled a corpse into my office. I was totally derailed oh for the God. rest of the day. It was, it was bizarre. So there's my story about what were you guys talking about that was so important that he felt like he still had to show up for the call. Oh, that's insane. It was the, well, that's the thing. Like it was the most bizarre thing. He had scheduled the the call the night before. Like he was already there. He already knew that she. I mean, she may have already passed passed by that point. I, like I never. I didn't ask. Let's be honest. Oh my but God. it was just like a catch up call. It was nothing. It was. That is wild. Nothing. Everything about it was just bizarre maybe so. <laughs> maybe she just like maybe he didn't like her yeah he good said, stuff said but mother. on that note let's get started <laughs> all right yeah who knows who knows yeah that's our first one uh i didn't pick any of these <laughs> i don't know what these are about let's see can you really build tools for remote teams if your team doesn't work remotely and I, I knew yeah. this for sure. I've heard many times that people like just gave a lot of shit to Slack because they were not, they like were adamant against remote work. Like they were like, we will not let our engineers work remote. Yet they, you know, build a tool that they tout as a remote work tool. So I don't know, Laurel, like what, what's your immediate reaction to this? My immediate reaction is this is funny because I actually commented on this thread. Oh. Um, so I, I do have a very real reaction to this, which is, of course it's possible, right? Like anybody can identify a gap in any industry. It doesn't have to be your specialty. Anybody can mm -hmm. think of an idea. Um, however, I think the advantage is in the long term. If you are a remote team, obviously your research and development processes um, are going to be real time. You're going to be continually developing product, uh, product research and, and development ideas. And so I think long term, you're, you're, not going to be as strong as your competitors if your entire experience is based on an idea as opposed to ongoing research. I just, yeah, I've always thought that dog fooding was just so important in product. Like you have to be using it. I know somebody the other day tweeted, does Figma design use Figma design to design for Figma? And I think the answer was definitely yes. I mean, they have to, that's the only way they're going to find gaps in their own product is by using it for its own intended purpose. I don't know, I've always felt it was weird that Slack was so adamantly against remote because it, it signaled a problem that they weren't 
able to solve the problem themselves i don't know that that's that's where i see it is like they it's like a weird lazy approach to product if you can't fix your own problem then your your product's not ready yet you know you need to be yeah. able and to fix it not not understanding your consumer profile yeah. like if you can't adapt to the needs and really understand the mindsets of your consumers then there's so much stuff in like you're shooting yak. yourself in your foot yeah there's so much stuff in yak that like jordan and i will go back and forth and be like this isn't working because we're using it and we realize that this is not working so we have to fix it or we have to change it or we have to add a feature remove a feature whatever it is because we like see it in real time as we're using it i don't know hunter like what, what are your thoughts I'm sort of torn on this one because I know that um, I, I heard a story when I was in L.A. that the Facebook team, they were having trouble working with teams that were in other countries. So like users in India, for example, don't have as great of Internet connection as they do, let's say, the United States or in uh, Europe. And so what they did was they took the entire like IP address, like the entire building in this one Facebook office and brought them all the way down to the same internet type. Mm. I don't know how it all works, but basically they forced their engineers to see the yep. problems and they right. said that they ended up solving all of those problems. So that's sort of like an anecdote, but that's what I see here is like, I feel like you need to at least experience remote work even one day a week to know what the problems are. Because I 100% agree either. with that. I think that's a great idea. Throttling the internet connection just so you can get a feel for what it's like in a third world country and how they access your product. I think that's crazy important. Jordan, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with you, Laurel, here. Like, I think you can build a product. I mean, really, you can do anything, right? But I think you don't get that magic until, like, under, and you said uh, you experience it for yourself. I think it's one of the things you have to kind of go through to know the real problems and how to really solve it. So, so maybe the answer is you can build tools, but at some point you will hit a wall right. if you're not dog fooding. You have to, like, experience what your users are experiencing to you know, truly do it. But I mean, this comes back to what I say to a lot of VCs is like, they continually ask us a lot of times, like, well, what is, you know, what's the difference between Yak and a lot of other products? And like, one of the main things that I always talk about is that I've always seen other products in the space treat remote as a problem, because they think that it's like an issue that everybody's not in the same office. And I'm like, dude, no, it's a superpower to like, be able to focus and be on your own and like be heads down. And all these other products are trying to approach it from like a, well, we're gonna fix the remote problem. And it's really just like you need tools that understand remote and are built for remote, not to like slap a virtual office on top of it or like make everybody feel like they're in the same location. Cause it's actually like helpful to not be in the same location. I don't know, Laurel, like have you, uh, what's your stance on that? The like remote is a problem we need to fix type of thing. Oh, this has been my messaging for the past decade is um, everybody is not seeing the wood for the trees, right? They're so focused on, like you said, that it's a problem, it's a hindrance, or that it's just a convenience, that it's all about employees mm. being able to wear sweatpants and sleep in late. Yeah. And my entire career exists because my messaging is, no, 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 this is a business strategy to leverage. There is so much profitability to be accessed if we leverage this as a model. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's productivity cost savings and, and there's employee retention and benefits and and recruiting costs and like all of these things that just go on and on and on and so businesses if they for once if they would focus more on the bottom line that's where they would see the most satisfaction yeah definitely i think it's a managerial thing like i've seen so many product leads and managers that they don't want to like release the the reins like they're afraid of what would happen if their team went remote and I feel like if you're building a tool for remote, you have to have this thing in mind of like being able to change that behavior. What does your product do to get somebody to the mindset that remote is not this scary experience. It's actually this liberating experience that allows people to work better, work in their environment. But yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm bullish on this. I think like you have to be working remote to build a remote tool because I, I see too many tools building it from the perspective of like, oh no, we work in an office so that we can start to make remote remote work more like an office because that's the environment we want to build for a remote team versus us is like, we will purposefully, like we did this when we were building Yak is we went a whole day using only voice communication just to see how complicated it would be to like not use Slack or email at all. And then same thing, like we will go work remote, like Hunter will just like go to a coffee shop just to like see what it's like to work from a coffee shop all day long 
without like your own equipment, without your quiet space. Oh, it turns out like I need headphones on all the time because I need to focus. Maybe we could build things around like, you know, hands-free mode on headphones. Like you start to like find things um, once you experience it for the first time. But all right, let's go to the next one. Uh, I'm playing a little bit of roulette here. I don't even know what I'm bringing up. Oh, I love this one. This was mine that I got to put in. Um, I don't know if you guys saw this and it's Google. So who knows if it will like even exist. It could just like be vaporware that never gets made or they'll make it and tear it down in like three weeks. But essentially Google's working on this thing that will basically replace audio that is lost. So like if, if there's packet loss in like a video conferencing call or like what we're doing right now, they're gonna use AI to essentially like mask that break and replace it with like AI audio so that it you can't even tell that you had a poor connection because it could figure out kind of what you were saying and improve the actual vocals at a network level instead of worrying about what you actually said having to transfer over. And this gets into some creepy dystopian future thing too. We're already talking about like deep fakes where you see President Trump or Biden saying something that like they didn't actually say. And now it's being done in real time over a video yeah. call. I mean, that's what I was, I, I can start with this. I mean, Justin, I know you and I all the time when we do calls, we like to record our calls, just like document things and, and have, I don't want to say the word evidence, but I don't know what else to say. This gets like really weird, especially, you know, if somebody's like filling in the gaps for you and you like, you want that documentation of a recorded call, but it's not even actually what you said or like what you meant. So this get this can get super weird in my opinion. I, I, I feel really weird but about it, this. But it solves the problem that Hunter brings up a lot, which is that something like Yak is one of the only tools that works cross culture, cross company, cross internet provider, where Zoom a lot of times can struggle to stay afloat. Like we talked to Charles last week and he was just going over the data on like what countries even bother to turn on video. And most of that has to do with like just network bandwidth limitations. So imagine if there was zero barrier to real-time synchronous communication because an AI is going to take over. Um, Laurel, thoughts? I just feel like this is misdirected attention. I, I mean, it's it's a good idea. Like we, we've all been in this scenario where this has been a pain point. So we all get it and we all relate to it, but I wonder if there is a, a deeper root to the problem that we should be focusing on instead mm. instead of investing our time and energy and money into this solution should we be focusing on just getting better bandwidth to more people yeah yeah or being able to have a higher um you know operational power of the systems with less bandwidth or something like mm. that i mean you guys know i'm not a techie i don't i'm clearly out of my element here but as a non-techie, I'm looking at this and thinking, I feel like we're solving the wrong problem. It is, it is an interesting approach to go at the like, the middle of the problem and still like, the, mm. instead of the, like the beginning of the problem. Hunter, it's what a, do you think? Attacking this, it's like attacking the, I like what she said, I didn't think of that. Attacking the symptoms rather than the, the root of the problem. Um, but Laurel, mm. I actually wanna ask you a question about this because to me, this Google isn't solving the infrastructure problem. So even if they are masking the symptoms, what's really interesting for me is that um, my team in, let's say, India, um, I often don't get on Zoom calls with them because the audio breaks up so much. I mean, forget video, that's not even possible, but the audio mm -hmm. breaks up too. So I'm wondering what you think about the inclusivity of being able to say, okay, everyone basically has the same playing field when it comes to audio. You know, this really is, speaking of going to the root of the problem, like this is beyond software, this is beyond culture, this is beyond anything, like this get, gets down to equal accessibility to broadband internet. Um, and so until we solve that problem on a sociological level and on a, a public sector in a government affairs level, we really can't do much. Again, like we can strategize and we can focus on how do we make use better use of what we have and make that stretch as far as possible but we really as as a government consultant on the topic of remote work this is a major pain point mm -hmm. and the people they're asking us to bring virtual jobs to people in, in rural counties and um, in order to save the economic development and we're like they can't have a job unless they have internet so like we really this has been happening since the 80s and 90s of trying to get internet to more people and until we solve that problem we can't do much more we talked about this two weeks ago actually it was one of the tweets that we brought up was now that school 
is like required to be online and you can't not go to school right so does that make internet now a public right that all k through 12 have to do online school currently at least um, now, is it something that you'd be mandated to have? Is there a government stipend for providing some basic level of internet to everybody at a reduced or free cost? I, I think it's interesting that you went there because we struggled to have this conversation two weeks ago, but now that you see masking the symptoms, you just went right back to, well, internet's a basic right, so why don't we solve that before we slap some AI on the problem? Exactly. And there's a lot of funding, especially from Google, that could really help with this, right? But um, yeah, I mean, it, and it's frustrating that we're in this position that now we had an emergency situation that required the use of this for millions of people, uh, billions of people all over the world. And we hadn't been listening to the message for so many decades. We could have been doing this for decades and preparing for this and building the infrastructures. And we didn't, and we missed the boat, but hopefully this will be the wake up call that we need in I, order to make I the right so decisions in the future. I live in a bubble because I would have never thought that, like I've heard of Netflix and Amazon throttling the quality of their content to save bandwidth so that everybody has like equal access to the internet. I, mm -hmm. I thought in 2020, like bandwidth on the internet was not an issue. Like I, I, maybe I just still, you know, the internet series of tubes, all that shit that they talk about. Maybe I'm still in the dark on how the internet works. But, like, where is the clog? Like, I didn't think in 2020, we still had the ability to like clog the pipes up. Um, or just accessibility. I live in Connecticut. I, and like, I mean, this is, I'm not, I mean, right in between Boston and New York, two of the major metro areas of the world. And I, just a few months ago, had to dig a trench a half a mile long to get internet to my house. Like, this is absolutely, it was something that I took for granted, just thinking, uh, oh, of course, if I buy a house and I move into a house, it's internet. going to have yeah, internet. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like, didn't even think about it. We're in between two new construction neighborhoods, like, didn't think about it. My house is 30 years old. And yeah, and so yeah, that lit a fire under me saying, if I can't access it in the location that I'm in, then we really have a problem in very rural areas, not only of our country, but of our world. That's crazy. I, yeah, I, I guess I just don't have that perspective. And sometimes, you know, just like we talked on the, on the last slide, maybe you have to step into the shoes of a different person or a different, you know, culture or, you know, situation to understand that things aren't always as easy for everybody else um and we can't have a savior complex either and think mm -hmm. oh because i have ai like i'm gonna save the world like no we see this with like taking <laughs> virtual jobs to refugees right we're like oh i'm gonna save your life and it's like no this puts them in more danger in this world that they live in we have to come from a place of empathy in order to solve problems wow that's uh, that's some super deep insights on the uh, on that. I love that. Yeah, All right. No, that's good. That's good. Um, I don't know what this is. Hunter, you want to grab this one? Yeah, I'll take. I'll take. Yeah, I'll take this one. So this was Monday.com. They just released their state of remote work. Laura, I'm sure you've probably seen this as well. Um, just some of the bullet points that I just wanted to highlight was that uh, due to COVID, a lot of people got to try out working remote, and it's 69% of people, or maybe it's 60%. But 69% of people enjoy working from home more than they expected to. Um, so I just kind of want to like open up the floor because I think a lot of people weren't trying remote because they expected that they wouldn't like it. Um, I just, this was mind blowing to me that people are actually liking it, especially given the circumstances. Yeah, so <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, it is we're in a very tricky situation right now because um, allowing remote work and truly adopting remote work for the long term are two very different things. And so people are saying, yeah, this is fantastic and I wanna do this. And then we're just like we were talking about before, it's stuck at the mid-level management for final approval. Uh, so again, if we zoom out, go to the root of the problem, then it is more of a situation of have we updated the infrastructure of the company for this to be a viable business continuity plan? We can't just say that something's fun and easy and uh, expect for this to, to become the new normal. We need to be willing to make the correct changes in order to allow for this to be sustainable. So yes, of course it's, it's great. Like it, 
who wouldn't like working from home. However, um, is this sustainable doing this for a couple of months as opposed to a couple of years are two very different things. And we need to make sure that people are making their decisions wisely and with the correct information as opposed to just a knee jerk reaction. I mean, I'm surprised by this figure because the, the response that I've seen, well, I mean, I've talked about this a lot is I think we're going to see two things, right? You'll see companies that never go back and they just, they're remote. This was amazing. And then you see a lot of companies that were like, this was horrible. We hated remote work. It didn't work at all. Remote sucks. And, you know, we're never going back to it again. And my immediate reaction to that is always, well, like, yeah, dude, it was born out of a crisis. Like you weren't prepared. You didn't have the tools. You didn't have the processes in place. No one told you how to do this. Of course, it was a terrible experience for you. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually surprised. And this isn't what remote work right now. Yeah. Like what we're doing right now, this is not remote this work. Is this is <laughs> Exactly. Right. This is learning from home, working from home, shopping from home, worshiping from home. Like every, like, no, Fitness, even us as remote day. expert. Yeah. Like even as experts and veteran work, remote workers, yeah. I've been a remote worker for 13 years and I'm stressed and overwhelmed right now. Yep. Like this is, this is not remote work. hundred percent. So that's what I'm saying. I'm so surprised by the 69% um, percent figure because you would mm -hmm. think that people like for me, um, my, uh, my wife and I just started fostering classes. And so every Monday we were supposed to actually go and like sit with 20 other people and learn how to foster children. And I was excited for that because I'm a social butterfly. Like I, I was going to get in there and meet people and talk to them. And I work from home. So like that opportunity to get out of the house and like, you know, shake some hands and stuff was super exciting. And now it's all on Zoom. So I spend, you know, eight hours a day attached to my laptop and then three more hours on Mondays doing a Zoom call listening to some dude talk and I hate it so much. And so like for me, as someone who's like born out of this era, I'm hating it. I'm surprised that 69% of people are enjoying it, which is good. I mean, that, that says good things about where we'll be in the future, but I'm surprised that people, um, you know, didn't do it. I, I think it's funny that we've got 70% basically that enjoy doing it. And then you've got roughly like 20% that work with a pet or a child on their lap. I bet there's a large overlap with the 30% who said they didn't enjoy remote work and the 17% that have a child on their lap the entire time. Um, that, that sounds like a very different working environment for probably most people. Um, nobody here has kids. Do you have kids, Laurel? I do. I have two kids uh, and it has not been easy. No, they are not allowed into my office. No. Um, they, but I have laxed up my rules a lot. Um, previously, it's like, hey, if the door is closed, I'm working mm. the end. And they're very well trained. I mean, they were both raised with me working from home, so they get it. Um, however, right now, no way. Like my husband and I can't both lock ourselves in this office and not never see them throughout the day. And this is stressful and, and um, a tricky time for them as well. So we need to be more accessible as parents. So previously my kids were never seen in a video call at ever uh, like very strict um, because, you know, as a working woman, you can't be seen as a remote worker just because you can be home with your kids. You need to maintain credibility in your profession and not just be seen as a working mom. And so I was always very strict about those rules because of that. But now I'm like, come on over. Like this, this is life right now is that it's not work-life balance and not work-life integration. It's not all of these stupid terms. Now it's just a blur. Everything is a blur all the time. And we need to be very, very, very accommodating to people as they make the adjustment. Let me, let me ask you, Laurel, last time I would talk to you was about a year ago. And one thing that, that really stuck with me from our conversation was you mentioned that, uh, you were finding at that time, at least, I don't know what it is now. I'm curious what it is now that Folks who work from home, their kids did better in school. What is it? Have you seen any changes in that, any update on that due to the circumstances? Yeah. Yeah. There are so many reciprocal effects of uh, remote work that are so fascinating to see because, yeah, there's just more accessibility of family dynamics. This is what, part of what we um, research at the World Economic Forum is what are the ripple effects? Yes, this is good for business output. We know that. Yes, this is good for work-life balance. We know that but what is happening outside. And yeah, uh, we're finding lower rates of childhood obesity, um, of environmental sustainability, of um, just, you know, latchkey kids can maybe be a term that is left in the past. Like all of these mm. sociological uh, impacts are something that are really, really fascinating to watch. 
That's awesome. That's, I, I love these facts. I'm just reading through these, Hunter. Um, like 28% eat meals that are healthier. I think that's super interesting because I've noticed myself, yeah. I'm eating healthier. But Jordan, you don't even cook. So are you eating healthier or are you just throwing <laughs> no, pockets? Bro, I've been, I've, been, I've been sending you snaps. I've, uh, I've been cooking. I've been a cooking fiend lately. But jokes aside, I, I have been um, eating a lot healthier because, you know, when you're not getting home super late, it's easier to, like, make dinner versus sometimes, yeah. you know, when you stay at the office late, it's like 9 p.m. I'm like, oh, I don't want to cook. Right? But I am eating a lot healthier. So that's really interesting. I, I found that I feel much better because I'm – at home all the time i'm not tempted to grab something on the way home i'm i'm actually yep. snacking more which i'm not a snacker so like i just never do and i think that's actually helped me stave off a little bit more weight because i'm not eating these gigantic meals really late at night because i got home yeah. late and like had to make this big meal because i was starving because i didn't eat all day i'm grabbing stuff like carrot sticks throughout the day or whatever and then when it comes to dinner time i'm like not loading up like i have like one piece of chicken and not like chicken and bread and pasta and all this other stuff so it's interesting how staying at home has forced me to actually eat healthier real food whereas when i had basically the world is my cornucopia <laughs> I go anywhere i still mm -hmm. relegated to just like eating wendy's instead because i was tired and i just wanted to like grab something for the drive through yeah. but you're a mom laurel so are you cooking and working Oh yeah, I love, but I love cooking. It's part of my um, how I turn my brain off from work at the end of the day. Same. If I go cook dinner, exactly. Yeah. yeah, but I will also say that there often I'm asked the question like, "What is your favorite remote work tool?" Right, and um, I have two. One is my my Fitbit that I wear to make sure that I'm not mm -hmm. sedentary, and but then my second always raises an eyebrow because I'm like, it's my crockpot. I love my crockpot yes. because. I can like, that's how I get into my mentality for the days. Like I prep dinner, get it ready and then have this homemade, healthy, delicious meal that's cooking all day because remote work is still work. So yes, I'm only a few steps away from my kitchen, but I'm tired at the end of the day and I'm still like, oh, okay, what am I going to cook? Like, it's still hard for me, even though I'm in the same space. So to have that dinner that is just there and healthy and hot and waiting for my family, if I, if my, if I'm not able to cook or waiting for me, if I am, don't have the energy to cook, like it's the yeah. best. Plus you get to smell it cooking all day and you get excited for dinner. It's great. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Mine's the sous vide. I have a, I have a dual sous yeah. vide and so I'll, throw a bunch of chicken in there and have that cooking all day at the very beginning of the kind of pandemic i cooked like a whole thing of like eight chicken breasts all at once in my sous vide and then i just had really really good juicy chicken for like a week which was amazing and i just cooked it all at the very beginning it's so funny how you classify non-remote work things as remote work mm -hmm. tools because you're right like i know jordan yeah. and me hunter's gonna laugh but like we have our <laughs> we have our aura ring which is, uh, yeah, the ring, oh the gosh. ring helping, yeah. us, helping us sleep. Hunter doesn't believe that our rings help us sleep, but they, they do. But yeah, I mean, it tells me like my body temperature, how ready I am for the day, if I should take a nap based off of like how I slept last night, gives me kind of like a trend for the week. And like, I, you could totally yeah. see the impact on my life for last week's craziness. What, what's, what's really interesting about all this to like sum it up, I don't know about you guys, but one thing I have noticed, uh, is that a lot more structure is in my day because of like working remotely. So like, I know at this time I'm going to do this, at this time I'm going to do this. And then at like the end of the day, I know I'm like, that's when I'm done working. And it's just, it's really interesting. There's no like anarchy of like, oh man, at the office, this may happen, this may happen. Just like boom, 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 lots of structure. So that's really cool to see too. Well, and that's just representation of what's happening in general is that as a remote worker, you are a self-manager, both of your professional life, but also of your personal life, which now are all one thing. So you have to be in control of that, of, hey, I'm not doing well at work. I need to sleep better. Or, hey, I'm, I'm burning out because I'm not eating a good dinner at the end of the day um, or whatever. Like all of our professional decisions merge very closely with our personal decisions. And we have to be responsible for all aspects of our self-management. So I'm not gonna start working until this time. And then I'm gonna take a break for lunch so that I am eating healthy and, and um, stabilizing my metabolism. Then I'm gonna go for a run at three o'clock because I noticed that I have a big mental block at that time. Yeah. And then I'm gonna come back, you know, like that's our responsibility. Yeah. yeah, and it helps so much professionally. Mm -hmm. Definitely agree. Uh, all right, what do we got next? 
this is actually really this, the same thing if you think about it. This was basically this, this concept of a CEO of a 400 plus employee business says working from home is working well, so well that he says he might not renew his San Francisco lease to save 10 million a year, which is just like an insane number. I can't even imagine throwing that into our runway for Yak. Like, if we had to tell somebody we spent ten million just to like exist in a building, that blows my mind. <laughs> um, and then just doing offsites, which is what you know the base camp guys always talk about, is that they do like an offsite once a year, like this huge blowout one week offsite, and that is what their team morale and like seeing everybody and get together. They do like group projects and stuff. It's just so interesting that someone who is so clearly baked into the deep, deep real estate side of non-remote work is just like, oh, this worked great. Like we could save 10 million a year. So, you know, Laurel, I'm curious, do you think that's real? Like, do you think that's gonna be a thing that you see a couple companies do? Oh, absolutely. There was a study conducted by Gartner just last week that talked uh, exclusively, not necessarily about uh, real estate, but just that CFOs in general are seeing the savings so much that they're saying, oh, well, this we cannot ignore this anymore. And so uh, they're keeping their workforces permanent from this point forward, not going back to the offices and then going back home, but from this point forward, they are now permanently remote workers. Wow. And it's staggering numbers, like 20 to 40% of enterprises, like insane. Um, it was as remote work consultants and you know industry thought leaders, it was kind of a, this one-two punch uh, when the big wave of remote work conversations and media attention came, that was the first punch. But then that report was the second punch saying, not only is this, speeding up the industry in general, it is happening right now. So yes, we see this on a massive level. Um, with our real estate consulting that we do uh, distribute, it's more about the conversation of how do you leverage, like what is the right decision? Because obviously if we have every single company all of a sudden just ditching all of their offices, we're going to have a real estate crisis. Mm -hmm. So it there's, you know, economically, we're not doing great already. And so we need to make sure that we're stabilizing. So we're helping companies make sense of their ROI calculations and identifying what is the best way to leverage your real estate in the long term. So is it going fully distributed and just never going back to the office? Or is it some type of hybrid model in which you have hub offices in certain locations where you have a high concentration of employees? Or is it turning your office into a co-working space or doing a shared desk option or blank, blank, blank? Like what makes the most sense for your company? And I think that's a big takeaway with remote work is that it's not one size fits all. It is, it should, it can and should be leveraged and customized for each individual com company. Interesting. Hunter, do you think certain companies are going to, do you think you're going to see a trend with certain companies that do this and other industries that maybe don't? I don't know. I, I do know though that um, I think everybody's going to, at least the big guys, I think they're going to turn their offices more into like what we saw at Google. You know their Boston office. You walk out of the elevator, and it's an experience. It's not a. It's not a. I mean, they do work there. That don't get me wrong, but I mean, it's from getting lunch to all the way to like standing desks that have treadmills attached to them. Oh and my gosh! There's a firefighter pole between the floors. Right, and and there, I, I talk about this all the time. There was a full on like aircraft in one of the rooms with like napping pods. Now this was like a resort. I don't see a whole lot of work getting done there but i could definitely see like what laurel's saying is that these spaces turn from like actually sitting physically next to one another to somewhere that you actually like mm. just come to like be together um so i mm. i do notice that online a lot of people are talking about how they're just switching completely from office spaces to off sites and so i can see offices just turning into like we work i could just see them exploding from something like this yeah that's that's interesting i guess my thing is how do you justify the real estate investment if it's something you don't go to every day? Like as a Boy, manager, attention. right? Like, you know, Jordan and I are running numbers all the time and it's, if something's essential or not essential, if it became what you just said, which I think is cool. Like, I think you always talk about this, um, Hunter, just like an office is so important to just like what your employees think of coming to work every day. Like just, is there good art on the walls? Is it bright? Is it welcoming? Is there good food in the kitchen? Like, it has to be someplace that's like, I guess, inviting. But like, Jordan, what do you think? If we put, you know, an office on our runway and it wasn't 
essential? Do you, what do you think investors are even going to say? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's subjective to, you know, kind of your circumstances. I think if you have a billion person army, I think like Hunter said, you'll need some sort of office, uh, just at least for the sake of employer retention, because not everybody works the same way. Um, and I think in that case, it's justified. But I think if you're a small, super small team, um, and you make an office that isn't a necessity for you, and it may end up costing you more in the long run, then, you know, I, I don't think it makes sense for you to have an office. I think it's going to be a thing that's going to be case by case. And like Hunter said, it'll just be more spots to be together, not necessarily like an office with like desk and you have to sit there in front of a computer all day and work. It'll just be more, more like a spot you can all go to. Maybe there's a startup opportunity here for instead of co-working spaces, co-lounging spaces, and you share, you know, that real estate cost with five other startups and it's just like a chill place with bean bags and kombucha you, you know what i think of is like a i know it's kind of a thing already but a, a bunch of startups or like even some gaming teams that have like houses for example like i know like space Bank, for example like that like a house I, I can see stuff like that happening like a house per startup or something like that that's interesting all right what do we got next i think this is the last one okay the y combinator uh change uh, Laurel, did you see this mm. news that they they changed their uh, their pro rata stake? No, no. I this is definitely your world. So explain this to me. Yeah. So from a startup perspective, YC is like you get in and you're guaranteed investment, and they have like these very strict pro rata uh, rights where basically like that's the whole concept of YC is like you get in, you're made for life, right? Like you get the press out of it, you get the investment out of it, but also like you just get in, you do the program, you get money. Like there's no question. Um, so it's interesting. They changed their policy so that investment is now case by case and their pro rata stake is not as high. So, you know, I don't know if this is a signal of fear in the marketplace of we don't know what VC is going to look like moving forward. Is there going to be money to invest? You know, what's the economy doing? Or is this the reverse? Let's look at it a little bit more positively. We want more people to have access to YC resources without investment being this, because obviously they would have to be so much more strict about who they let into YC um, if investment is this guarantee. But if it's not, and you just want to think you view YC as like a resource, maybe now you can open it up to more people. And you know they did their demo day remotely, and I think Hunter, you showed me that they were now even talking about not even requiring people to go to, to SF. It was just like. You could just, yeah. I don't know, do it online or something like that, maybe? So just to, to sort of zoom out, I think this is like one anecdote to what I think is might be happening you know, nationwide. So Laurel, I'd actually pitch the, the conversation over to you. Like, are you seeing, I know you're involved with like governments and obviously real estate investors. So you're working with people that are doing a lot of investment. Like what's, are, is anybody changing? And obviously they are, but like, what, what does that look like as far as like sort of generally? Is money available? Are people investing? Are they shutting it yeah. down? Are they just tightening the purse strings? Yes. Uh, so it's just right now, especially, it's just a matter of locking things down and everybody's mind is on resiliency and continuity to wait out the storm. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, this is not a three week problem and it, it may not necessarily be a three month problem either. And so I think that people, I think that this is a, a very micro example of, of a macro mentality of we don't necessarily want to give up our unique value proposition and and uh, sacrifice the culture of our brand however we also have a responsibility to our employees and to our community to be responsible and this is what that looks like it and it probably is going to get more and more drastic over time but i think uh yeah i mean there's just nothing certain about the future right now mm -hmm. Jordan, yeah, what do you think I, I, about um, the YC badge maybe not being quite as much of a badge, you know, if this change happens? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. We, I think we've seen like a lot of companies. It's like, oh, like YC just doesn't seem as excited anymore. Like, it kind of lost its alert. So I, I think doing this, to be honest, like cutting the probata stake, I think it furthers that. To be honest, it's like, okay, well now more funds are going to get deployed into more companies which more people will not have the YC badge. And again, just like kind of lessening what it's worth. And also, I mean, just, you know, as we've seen and as we've raised, 
other gazillion companies out there who haven't gone to YC who are insanely successful and yeah. are doing it super well. Um, and, I, and I think also as we move to a more remote world, uh, you know, I think YC will kind of lose its alert because part of it, you know, initially was like, you got to move there, you got to go to San Francisco, you got to be on site. But that's just not realistic anymore. So, yeah, I mean, I, I obviously I hope the best for them, but I, I think this move doesn't help. And then also requiring on site doesn't help. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. I think you're right, though, yeah. that we're moving into a world where it's almost ridiculous to think you have to show up at a physical location for a fixed amount of time to be you know, successful. Like, there's no way that you guys can run your company without flying here and living here for three months. I think that we you live in a world where that's not expected anymore. You know what's crazy? I mean, even since we did our first initial race, the very first time, like almost a year and a half ago until now, even the conversation or like how people approach us is different. At first it was, oh my God, you're in Orlando, Florida. Now it's just kind of like, okay, you like you live in Orlando, Florida. And that's kind of it, you move on. So, it, it, I mean, it's super crazy to so see even just in just like a year, just over a year, like mm -hmm. how much things have changed. Well, and just a mentality of risk in general. We're coming out of an economy where everything was really strong. Like we could have a gig economy. We could have the highest entrepreneurship rates and small business rates because there was just more flexibility for risk. And that was a luxury. And we're not headed into a strong economy anymore. And so that means that we don't get to play as much. We don't get to have access to as many wants. We now need to focus more on needs. And it's, you know, it's a high and low cycle and we'll be back in the high again eventually. But right now it's playtime is over and we got to get serious. Yeah, agree, agree. Dustin, what do we, is that it? Do we have any more? I think that's it. Um, I want to know if Laurel has any more dead body stories. Like just <laughs> what's, um, <laughs> Have you ever had a company that just rejected remote work altogether? And like, what was their reasoning? Oh, that's my job. Yeah, <laughs> I just want to know, like, what, was, what was an executive yeah. that was like, we'll never do it. You can't convince us. And now so they are. So it's actually, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that we can't even get started on that. Because <laughs> um, now everybody is an expert, right? Like literally oh, yeah. six weeks ago, I was begging companies like, please be more transparent. Like, I know that you offer some remote jobs. Would you be willing to speak at this conference? Or would you be willing to like yeah. list this job as remote friendly? Absolutely not. Um, so I can't even list how many hundreds of companies that applies to. Um, but it's not the executives that drag their feet. It's the mid-level managers. The executives are all on board because they're like, well, yeah, like this is what I do. I'm always traveling to clients yeah, and, and to conferences. They're like, oh, yeah, like I'm a remote worker. And they, they love it. Um, the mid-level managers, those are the ones that are responsible for the results. And they're so ingrained into that that sensory management, I can see productivity happening. And so it's the most threatening for them and their their perceived job security. And so, yeah, the, they're the ones that, uh, that kick back the most. So not really interesting story there, uh, other than like all of the self-proclaimed experts now that everybody's a work from home expert. That was, that was super frustrating to see. But um, yeah, I, I, the other side, just to, to circle back where we came from, the other funny stories that I have also relate to video calls. And I'm a very big proponent right now of like Zoom backgrounds. If you don't have a clean, simple background, put on a Zoom background because the number of disasters that I've seen behind people, mm. I don't ever want to see again. But also, don't have video no, calls from bed. Like I, yes, there's so yes. many calls that are, they're like lounging yes. on their bed and like, or they're laying pitch, back and, like, and the laptop is like on their chest. So it's just like a, a <laughs> yes. view of like the bottom of their neck. I'm like, this is yes. wildly inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, And it's like not any thing that you want to stare at for like 30 minutes to an hour is like the underside. No, of and feel like out. you're in bed with them. I'm yeah. like, mm, <laughs> this is super cool for That's, a professional meeting. That's but... how you close deals, Laurel. You got to get in bed with them. That's get the... Literally. Yes, that's right. That's right. Wow. No, that's so true. We should do like a series on just like video etiquette. Just like tips we and should. tricks on like how to not look like a We player. actually, joke, jokes aside, we should because uh, I mean, even Hannah, for example, she like some of her coworkers, you know, they're all going remote for the first time. And it's just like, oh my God, <laughs> it's like the wild west for them trying to figure it out. It's it like, is. Like, well, and there's a lot of culture to navigate because you don't have like 
power shake, you know, handshakes, you don't have power ties, you don't like you can't really make eye contact. Like this is all very new territory. So people don't understand what professionalism looks like in a virtual world. Well, I like your background. So I was noticing the other day that like just a general mm -hmm. tip is to do it against a blank wall because mm -hmm. you don't have that BBC reporter problem where it's against an open door where the door could open and like stuff could happen. Cause like, even if your scenario, if uh, the door opened in your office, you could take care of it, you know, before it comes into view. Like my wife just- Yeah, I'm looking at my door. door. Exactly, my wife just yeah. walked in and needed me to unlock the car door. And I could just like look here, give her a thumbs up and she didn't come into the view. It wasn't distracting for everybody. I mean, Hunter apparently is in front of one of the like paintings from the White House of like- <laughs> like, like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a golfer, so. This is uh, this is not. This is never. Not terrible, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, it's Arlen. it's counterintuitive. Yeah. Well, so I started my my t career way back when as an interior designer, and so when you look at that in a room, it feels very weird, right? Because it's like this table that's floating in the middle of the room or like close to a mm -hmm. wall, and then you know, so in a room it doesn't make sense. So most people don't think about it because they're trained that your furniture goes against the edges of the wall. And so they don't think about it, but I totally agree with you. Like in a pinch, worst case scenario, just turn around, like scoot your table two feet away from the wall, sit in between your table and the wall and you're good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, just for the sake of having a good background. I mean, Hunter doesn't have a plant today. It looks like Jordan's I know. got two. He made up yep. for me. I, I, I got a little, a little fake. Yeah, here you go. Cheers to you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's let's... amazing how, how much better it looks behind Jordan with just two plants. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, it would look phenomenal. like he's in like a clean room where Dexter yeah. like removes the limbs <laughs> off a... of people. Well, I, I, I got a quarantine. Uh, my new desk that just just came today, so I still gotta make my setup a little better. No, it looks I project that to be a trend. We're going to see majorly pimped out home offices over the next year. That's become a uh, thing. I'm like sponsor things in the background, right? Yes. Yes. Well, it's <laughs> yep. become a thing like the MTV Cribs back in the day. You'd like welcome yes. people into your cribs. I've seen actual like Instagram lives where it's like just yeah. checking out the office today. Let's go ahead and see what my setup looks like. And it's like touting monitors and like your desk and like your mic setup and like that's become the new clout thing. Flexing is... so hard. I don't like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, you got to flex about your your office now because it's the only thing you got going for you. We can't see Jordan's fancy shoes. For all I know, he's not even wearing pants. No, so I am the. Did we... you guys see someone actually? Uh, someone commented because we had a Laurel. You'd appreciate this. We had a we had a challenge out that was like the clean desk challenge. Just something really fun that we keep doing every like two months because what else are you going to do as a remote worker right it's either right. what's your view or what's your desk look like right and so right. we just did that and someone had this long thing that said you're now desk shaming and this is like what's wrong with the industry oh my like, god what? oh my oh, word i did not desk see that shaming? coming I was like, you should yeah. see my dev. I'm not shaming anybody. Yeah, mine is a mess. <laughs> not even in my own room. I have to take like really strategic yeah. photos just so you don't see all the crap on my desk. So right. I, right. 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 I have a like, from, yeah. <laughs> this is from like here over it, it's all that looks clean. Yeah. <laughs> Jordan moves all of his furniture out of frame so you can't yeah. see it. That's no, like, I'm not kidding. My old desk is literally right here. Everything to the left of me is so messy. It's just, this like, is just like my photo. It, it, is, it is. It's just this is Absolutely. this and, and Laurel, just like you said, there could be a dead body to your left, you know? Oh Nobody would ever know. So as long as you don't move your webcam and show us, then we're none the wiser. That's so it's right. okay. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I've been very busy in quarantine. Um, <laughs> what a way to end. I love it. <laughs> what a way to end. So, Laurel, we're going to have you back. Yes, thank and you. And we're going to do like a tips and tricks video yep. with you because I think that would be really tight. Uh, where that would can, be so fun. Where can people find you online? How can they get in touch with you? How can they tell you apart from all the remote work experts that are floating around? <laughs> um, well, let's see. 
if how do you tell the difference? If you ask me a hard question, I can answer it. Let's oh, say that. Okay. And most other people can't. And honestly, that's how I screen my own consultants is I just have a video call with them and I just take it to a really deep level really fast. And if they can match my speed, then I'm I know that they've been at this long enough to think deeply. Um, and if somebody says that remote work is not ideal, that's a winner because they understand the pros and cons, right? Like everybody else is just such an evangelist. They're like, yeah, this is the best. And they're just capitalizing on SEO. And it's like, no, you can't really understand what it's like to facilitate a change management process unless you know the bitter and the sweet. Not a one so, size fits all. Right? Yeah, exactly. Well, awesome. So uh, yeah, distributeconsulting.com, uh, remoteworkassociation.com. I'm the only Laurel Farr on social media. So it's pretty easy to find me. Just look for me on Twitter and LinkedIn. We'll drop some links in the uh, show notes when this uh, goes up on YouTube. So we'll make sure that we uh, plug you and get some people to contact you. So thanks so much for your time. This Perfect. was awesome. Thanks we for having me. This was super fun. Along, so this was super cool. Love and uh, <laughs> yeah, let's uh, go ahead and cue it out. Cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks. Yes, yes.